incriminating. <laughs> it's my favorite time of day to talk. The caffeine buzz for everybody is wearing off. If you visualize anything, it's a good thing because it means your eyes are open and I've kept you awake. Um, and you're not thinking about the alcohol after the reception. So um, the talk was titled Visualization of uh, High Dimensional Bioinformatics Data, but um, I'm going to talk about visualization of high dimensional data in general. Um, so uh, in a little bit of the uh, outline of the talk, um, I'm going to talk about what is big data, and there are some very interesting characteristics that differentiate different kinds of data sets, uh, and uh, why you need good statistical graphics, um, some, uh, a little bit of a tour of high dimensional visualization using some data from, uh, that we've produced in the laboratory, and I'll tell you a little bit about the data set. Uh, and uh, then some uh, discussions about some of the promising areas of visualization and how far we really have to go. Um, so everybody's talking about big data these days. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, Nature, we're drowning in data. Uh, and, uh, but that's not unusual. We, we're organisms that live in the world. We, our brains drown in data every day. Uh, but um, as scientists and especially uh, computational modelers where we need time series data and lots of it to estimate parameters, uh, it's be the issue of how we handle data uh, and what we do with it and how we display it to make a point uh, is becoming one of the pressing problems of uh, at least uh, the next five to ten years. So what is big data? Um, well, I compiled a little table of uh, some common data sets. Uh, and uh, if you think about big data, you can define the absolute size of the data, meaning the number of elements, by the number of entities. This could be test subjects. This could be people for the Human Genome Project. Um, this could be uh, YouTube Comedy Slam votes on the database uh, from YouTube. Um, or it could be uh, 500 stocks in the Standard & Poor's Index. The number of attributes. Now, the attribute is the thing that, um, is, uh, that we initially tend to reduce um, data. So if you consider uh, in the first human genome sequence the attribute being a base pair location, because that first published sequence was actually an average of five individuals, um, then uh, you have about two billion attributes. Um, but you've got one instance of each attribute because there's one position. Now, if you, uh, if you look at the size of some of the other data sets, uh, you have things like the Affymetrix uh, Human Gene Chip Array, which uh, if uh, you do this on a mouse uh, series of points where you have uh, where you're collecting 11 data points or 11 time points and five mice per time point and you're running an Affymetrix chip on each of those, you've got 55 mice uh, and you've got about uh, 28,000 attributes. Um, but each of those attributes may have only one instance. And uh, if you're doing two photon microscopy of a T cell, uh, then maybe you record 2,200 T cells, um, but you're, you're abstracting your data, and so you've got only nine attributes. Now, why does this matter? Well, if you look at, uh, if you plot attributes versus instances or attributes versus entities, um, it becomes clear that we've got different types of data sets that can be clustered from each other. And uh, so if you look at these two largest uh, data sets, um, these are biologic data sets. They're the first human genome consensus sequence and the uh, uh, 1,000 Genomes Project, which actually has 1,700 genomes now, uh, which are all sequenced. But if you look at time series data sets, and the best one is the, uh, there is a space shuttle uh, series of data, which basically consists of nine measurements 
uh, at uh, about 28,000 time points. Uh, the space shuttle data set uh, ends up uh, being down here, low number of attributes, but lots and lots of time points. Um, so uh, we're mostly interested in time series data because biologically relevant things, especially in immunology, rarely happen at just one time point. So most of the data sets that uh, we're interested are um, in this realm, and as we add more attributes and are able to measure more things, uh, then uh, they move up into a different cluster. Now what about networks? Because networks have attributes. Now you remember that the data set size here um, is multiplicative, scales with the entity's attributes and instances. Um, but what do you need to define a network? Well, you need, um, you need two nodes connected by an edge. And um, this formula is an approximation because you don't know how many connections there are uh, to individual nodes, but it's about twice the number of edges that you have in the network. And there's a correction factor for the uh, nodes that have duplicate edges that I haven't put in here. But you'll notice the size of these network data sets um, are much smaller than the size of the uh, entity data sets that we study. And I'm going to talk about uh, both of these types of data sets. So what's the problem with high dimensional data? It's, of course, the curse of dimensionality. So the more uh, points you measure um, and the more measurements you do, uh, you've got increased noise, you've got increased error rates, and uh, of course, uh, relevant to us as modelers, you don't have enough measurements for good estimates, um, either if you're estimating uh, statistical parameters or model parameters. So let me tell you about uh, our, one of our data sets, and uh, I'm going to use this throughout the talk as an example of visualization techniques. Some of these are very familiar to you, um, and uh, some of them may be novel. So the data set I'm going to be talking about was collected. Um, it, it's a high uh, frequency, meaning we drew blood every single day for um, 11 consecutive days in subjects that had been vaccinated with the seasonal trivalent influenza vaccine that uh, if you got vaccinated this year, that's what you uh, would have received. Um, if you got the injected vaccine. And so at every single time point, uh, we collected uh, B cells and peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and we performed daily flow cytometry, B cell LE spots. Um, we haven't done the Luminex protein assays, um, and we did some clinical chemistry. We did HAI titers, um, and we did RNA-seq of both PBMCs and B cells. Um, this was done by an incredibly dedicated group of people in my laboratory um, with a high degree of um, consistency, with the, which um, I won't talk about in detail, but something very, very important, down to ordering the same lots of assay plates um, and making sure that the same person was doing all the uh, one set of particular steps. So let's start out with HAI titers um, and uh, uh, spaghetti plots. Uh, so uh, spaghetti plots or pasta plots um, are overlaid uh, plots. And in this case, uh, the, uh, the dimensions are the time points here. You see the a baseline time point uh, prior to vaccination and every single day. Uh, after vaccination, and then a time point at day 21. And these are the three uh, viral strains in the vaccine, and an HAI titer is a uh, titer uh, of uh, sera that's required to prevent the aggregation uh, in an assay um, of red blood cells uh, with a virus. So, um, and a, a level of 1 to 40 is immune. So the problem with the spaghetti plots is we've got, so we've got 16 different subjects here. It's really hard to see any kind of pattern in this. Um, it, now, it depends on how clustered and consistent your data is. Things go up. Yes, Tim. <laughs> um, some of them go up sort of quickly. Some of them don't really go up. Some of them don't go up at all. 
Um, and uh, so larger numbers of subjects or of entities make this um, really difficult. And so this is a, a plot of uh, about 750 genes. And you can see you can't see anything here, which is why we need clustering. Um, and uh, so here's the resulting pasta plot. Um, <laughs> so here's the same data. Actually, uh, this panel is the same data. And this panel is 18 subjects uh, uh, that were vaccinated uh, with the, um, uh, the inhaled vaccine, uh, the flu mist. So, um, and these are, uh, these are sorted by initial uh, titer. So black uh, is the lowest titer. A titer of 1 to 40, which is immune, is a, about this red-orange color. And the highest titer, which is 1 to 1028 or above, is this yellow color. And uh, the time axis now is vertical for each of these. And now all of a sudden you can see some detail here in the data. Okay, what do we see? We see that in these naive, first thing we see is that there are three simultaneous immune responses going on. And uh, you can see that most clearly in this uh, first subject here who had no detectable uh, immunity uh, antibody immunity to either of the three influenza vaccines. And uh, you can see that at day seven, eight, nine, all of a sudden their titers increase. And you can see to a varying degree, you have different immune responses from different subjects. This individual uh, had no detectable titers to two of the vaccine strains and responded to both. This individual essentially didn't respond to any of the boosts by HAI titer. So now you look at the uh, inhaled influenza vaccine titers. So this is a B cell response to the vaccine, and you can see they don't change very much at all. Now this would have been easy to see on an overlay plot uh, because none of the lines would have changed very much. So how big can your heat maps get and how useful are they? Um, this is purported to be the, um, the densest data graphic um, in existence. Um, it's called the, uh, it's derived from the Lick Galaxy catalog. So this represents a, a conglomeration of uh, 14, over 1,400 individual photographs of the sky from the Northern Hemisphere. Each of those 1,400 photographs was uh, subdivided into uh, 1,400 uh, boxes. And in each of those boxes, they counted galaxies. So each point in this graph uh, represents a uh, proportional number of galaxies in the sky. So this is essentially a very, very large spatial heat map. And the granularity that you see in this heat map in terms of clusters of galaxies is actually real. So heat maps are actually quite efficient at presenting large amounts of data in a fashion um, that, uh, that we can immediately look at and don't have to explain, but there are drawbacks. So let's I want to talk a little bit about some of the heat maps um, that, uh, and data techniques for some of our gene expression data. So remember I told you we did RNA sequencing. We did it on five subjects uh, for uh, B cells. So we've got five replicates. We've got individual um, RNA-seq reads on every one of those 11 days. Um, this is just to tell you uh, some of the pre-processing that goes into the graphics. Behind every good graphic is uh, a lot of good statistics. Uh, so we started out with about 2,800 uh, RNA sequences, uh, different genes, um, lots of more sequences. Uh, we went through an initial uh, thresholding filter for gene expression, number of reads, uh, false discovery rate, a variation filter. We wanted genes that um, varied by at least 20% over time course by functional principle component analysis. Uh, and uh, you can see the different numbers of uh, significant genes that we identified. So then from that gene set, we asked, OK, we've got five subjects that are vaccinated. How many of those genes are common in at least some number of subjects? 
So uh, you see a uh, plot here of number of subjects and uh, number of common genes, and we selected a, a genes that were common among at least four of the five subjects and ended up with uh, 254 uh, common significant genes that changed after vaccination in the B-cell subset and 50 in the PBMC subset. So this is a heat map of uh, those subsets. So this is 254 genes. This axis is time. Day zero, which is the day of vaccination. Day 10, here's the HAI heat map below it. And uh, all of a sudden you see, uh, you see patterns. Our favorite uh, subject, T14, had a very, very uh, robust response with these nice uh, peaks. Many of these are uh, B-cell specific and plasma cell differentiation specific genes and transcription factors. Um, you see another subject, uh, T12, who had a little bit broader response. Uh, here's uh, our subject, T13, uh, who was that subject that did not have uh, immunity to uh, either of the three vaccine strains at the beginning of the uh, vaccine study, uh, but then developed a robust vaccine response uh, by antibody titer. And what you see is the, the gene expression response looks nothing like uh, or very little like the responses of the other two uh, subjects. So um, the heat maps here are very, very um, useful. You've got uh, 254 uh, uh, individual uh, genes. You've got 11 days. Uh, you've got five subjects. Um, so this is a lot of individual data points. And then for PBMCs as well. Now, the coloring of heat maps actually makes a difference in how you present the data. I like this because I think it looks like a stained glass window, but uh, the black, uh, and this is a five color heat map. The black background, um, however, uh, does not let you uh, pick out some of the nuances. And so this is a three color heat map uh, of exactly the same data uh, on a white background and scaled. So, as I said, behind every good heat map stands a good statistical analysis, and part of that statistical analysis is clustering. And if you're doing anything with a high dimensional data representation, you're gonna to need to know something about clustering. And uh, clustering based on patterns, hierarchical clustering, supervised and unsupervised clustering, because it's one of the major methods of data exploration. This shows you for some of the uh, gene expression uh, different uh, gene sets that were found with four different uh, clusters uh, using a clustering uh, method uh, that was uh, custom written in Mathematica. Um, now, any of you who have done clustering know that the big issue is how do you pick the number of clusters, and I'm gonna talk about that in a, in a minute. The bottom line to that is um, that there's always a tuning or threshold parameter, just like your 0.05% uh, significance factor in t-tests, which are arbitrary uh, to some extent, um, y.05 and 9.1. Enrico Fermi once said a miracle is something that has a one in 10 chance of occurring. Uh, and uh, there, really, uh, there really is, as Hulin pointed out and others uh, today, uh, you really do have to stop at some point. So what are the limitations of heat maps? Well, the color mapping can be deceiving. Um, Nonlinear uh, color maps uh, can uh, draw our perception and cause us to draw false conclusions. Um, it, there may be a very large range of data and it may be very difficult to fit uh, the data into a reasonable heat map range. There's a limitation in the number of colors that can be discriminated. So color gradients can give the illusion of discrimination. And um, if you're kind to the uh, approximately uh, five to 10% of the uh, population um, that is uh, colorblind, uh, you can't use red and green heat maps. So, you know, the people who initially published heat maps for gene arrays but clearly must not have been colorblind. Um, and uh, one of the trends that you see is the movement towards the red and blue heat maps. Um, for good pattern recognition, uh, you must couple uh, your uh, heat maps to good statistical analysis and generally clustering. So now let's talk about uh, some flow cytometry data. 
Um, and uh, this is a, a relatively uh, traditional picture of uh, flow cytometry gating with a uh, uh, topographic uh, representation of uh, spot density. Um, this is the same HAI titers. Uh, and um, here you see the gating uh, for the CD27, CD38 positive uh, antibody secreting cells. So um, we've done a fair amount of work, uh, at Melissa Ruda in my laboratory, um, in conjunction with Richard Sherman and using uh, FLOC. And uh, so uh, the data set that I'm going to talk about is uh, the flow cytometry data set from one of the flow panels that we uh, in those experiments. And this is a biplot, uh, a two-dimensional plot from FLOC, uh, where you've got a, a matrix of two-dimensional plots. And uh, they're pseudo-colored for each of the 23 clusters uh, that were identified in the flow cytometry data. So um, the first thing about these plots is they use double the amount of real estate that they really need to use. Um, these plots are actually uh, uh, images simply with the axes switched, um, and uh, so that you could actually get the job done uh, with half the number of plots. Um, the other thing is that it's hard to make sense going from uh, one two-dimensional representation to another um, of where that cluster really fits in in a, a high-dimensional space. So one of the things we did was uh, we clustered the centroids of the cluster. So each of those 23 clusters that we identified in, uh, this is longitudinal flow cytometry data, uh, we uh, created a concatenated set of files uh, for a template, um, and uh, we identified the clusters, and uh, this is the, these are the centroid flow cytometry values superimposed over a heat map of uh, those clusters. And we asked, is there any way to make sense of the uh, of those centroids and relate them back to the biology. Um, so this is uh, the this is X and Y semi-supervised uh, or uh, unsupervised clustering of the cytometry markers um, as well as uh, the various clusters. And you can see that they cluster nicely into you know, here are the CD20 uh, uh, positive cells over here. You've got uh, plasma cells uh, that are CD138 positive. Uh, those centroids are clustered here. Tells you nothing about the representation of uh, the percentages of those clusters. And also, the unsupervised clustering doesn't really relate to how we think as uh, immunologists. It uses absolutely no prior information. So we were interested in relating um, this uh, dimensional reduction to how we normally classify uh, uh, cells when we do uh, uh, serial flow cytometry gating and to standard representations of cell phenotypes in the cell ontology. So we took a semi-supervised clustering approach, and that is uh, Melissa uh, sorted each of the uh, each of the values. So this is, these are the fluorescence intensities for CD3, CD19, CD20 and sorted the clusters in order uh, of the CD3 representation. And uh, you can see a fairly clear cut uh, in uh, where you get increases. And we use that in a sequential uh, gating method. Um, so these are the cluster centroid values. And we found that we could reproduce a fairly standard uh, flow cytometry and cell ontology classification of these uh, cell cluster types. So this is a semi-supervised clustering representation of the same heat map. Um, and you can see the uh, CD3 positive staining cells here, um, CD19 positive. Clearly, we've got some cell types um, that are uh, double staining. These actually represent about 0.04% of the sample. Um, and uh, I've ordered these in the, uh, in the order of the semi-supervised clustering. And you can see how the various cell types break down. And indeed, these correspond to the um, cell ontology. So the next thing we look for is a representation of the uh, contribution, the percentage of all those cell types, uh, in our uh, uh, 
uh, in each sample. So this is a stack plot. Over time, 10 days, each of these uh, strata represent one of the clusters. Each of these labels are the um, labels from uh, down to the uh, third level of clustering that represent um, cell types defined by the cell ontology. Uh, and the area of the uh, strata layer is proportional to the percentage of cells uh, in that flow cytometry sample. So it adds up to 100%. And immediately, you can see here, not only do the uh, number of uh, plasma cells and plasma blasts go up at day uh, four, five, and six, but you can see the relative contributions, the uh, level of contaminants, these cells in gray are the cells that we don't really want to look at. Um, and you can see within the known categories of cells that we would identify, strata that are exploratory. So for example, we have uh, three different uh, clusters of plasma cells. And uh, the next thing we would want to know is, are these biologically real? but it gives you an instant visualization method for looking at all of the clusters across time. Not only that, for time series data, we can stack those plots underneath uh, the RNA-seq uh, gene array visualizations. And uh, so here's our, our favorite subject here. And you can see that the cell types migrating through the peripheral blood correspond to these gene peaks. Now. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, during Mike's talk that, well, you know, the, the RNA-seq uh, or uh, transcriptome uh, patterns that you see are a function of both the cells that are migrating through the peripheral blood and the gene expression that they have, as well as the phenotype. This type of representation lets you see that immediately without a lot of explanation. It also lets you look at which of these strata correspond to the different cell types. So, what are the limitations of biplots and stack plots? Well, they can become pasta plots with lots and lots of, uh, as the number of entities increase. Um, they also convey time as a static activity. So, one of the things we'd like to do is potentially use uh, three or four dimensions. In other words, we'd like to uh, visualize these in three dimensions and use time or make a movie of things. Um, so potential solutions including include add a third dimension. Well, that gets you a little more real estate. Software that allows the display of sequential plots as a movie um, and large scale immersive displays of data. So what do I mean by that? Well, one of our limitations is two and three dimensions and we all know that we remember things better and we understand things better when we can manipulate them. So when you get to know your data and look at it in different visualizations, change the axes, change the parameters, change the display, our brains are wired to find changes in those patterns. You know, the world is not static. We look around and what we notice are things that are moving and changing, especially if we can manipulate them. So the next level of uh, looking at this kind of data is immersive data visualization. I'm not gonna talk a great deal about this, but this is being developed at a whole variety of institutions. And uh, so, you know, one thing is um, uh, just get a bigger monitor and with more pixels. Um, <laughs> Tim has actually solved that problem, and any of you who are interested, he's got a high-definition projector and discovered the Benjamin Moore paint that gives you the, or found on the internet, the Benjamin Moore paint that gives you the highest definition on your wall in your office. So, um, you know, that means you just have to have a bigger office uh, <laughs> with lots of blank walls. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps the science fiction version of that was those of you who have seen the science fiction movie with uh, Tom Cruise, Minority Report, where he has that wonderful uh, display in two dimensions where he can manipulate things um, and move them around. Um, one of the reasons to think that, that 
visualization of, of high dimensional data uh, may require that kind of thing for understanding is that ability to manipulate. So it's not just having more screens and more real estate. We have to have software that will um, allow us to change rapidly the way we visualize something. Let me talk a little bit about clustering methods and multidimensional scaling. Because really we can't, even the, you know, if we had all the walls of this auditorium painted with data, it helps to reduce the uh, amount of uh, real estate that we use to look at the data. And so what we really do is dimensional reduction. Okay? Our brains do dimensional reduction. We don't look at individual, after we learn to read, we don't look at individual letters. We look at word patterns. We're pattern recognition machines. We're designed to see the um, changes from the foreground and the background, to see that uh, gazelle running through the, uh, uh, the savanna, so that, because that's our next meal. Um, that's how our brains have evolved. We need to think of our, our data in the same sense as our next meal and to figure out what are the key things. Now, you know, we go too far sometimes, but um, one of the things that uh, is crucial and that we like to do is figure out how closely related things are to each other. So here's the same uh, heat map of these um, cluster centroid values, essentially a vector um, with uh, 10 parameters. And I've used a technique called multidimensional scaling, which uh, calculates an n-dimensional distance uh, between uh, any of these points. So it's basically a uh, each of the points and creates a distance matrix. Um, that distance, distance matrix allows us to, uh, can then be plotted um, in two dimensions. And so the distance between any two points um, in this two dimensions is proportional to the Euclidean distance between those points. Now, there are lots of mathematical um, issues with this, including um, sparse data, and as the number of dimensions goes up, there are issues with where um, all of those points end up. Um, but you can see here, applied to this data set, that um, this data-driven approach has clustered the CD138 plasma cells. Here are the plasma blasts. Over here are the naive, unactivated B cells. Here are some memory B cells closer. Um, you can see that um, those CD3 positive cells, some of which are uh, a bit messy because they stain for CD20 and uh, CD19. Um, so these are probably a, a population of, uh, of either dying cells that are non-specifically staining or some other cell type. You can see that they're kind of all over the map here. Now, this map doesn't tell you what the proportions are, but if you scale the um, plots, so that the size of the dot gives you some idea of the uh, proportion. Now you can see which clusters are uh, and which uh, uh, centroid values are closer to each other uh, and which are not. Now, a little bit more about this dimensional reduction method. So um, this, uh, this method actually does reproduce uh, relative distances between uh, entities. So this is just a, a this is a, the usual demonstration method of this, uh, where you've got the distance between any two um, cities by airline flight. So Boston to Chicago, uh, New York to Seattle, um, and this is uh, the only data that you uh, feed into the uh, dimensional reduction method. And uh, using that, uh, you the uh, I've created this plot. Um, that uh, derives the relative locations of each of the cities just from the uh, airline flight distances uh, between each other um, for the whole data set. And you can see that these map relatively well, uh, with the exception of Washington, D.C. being located somewhere in the middle of Ohio, um, <laughs> which may be also a factor of the projection I've used for the, uh, for the U.S. map. Um, and we talked about that. Now, multidimensional scaling is related to principal component analysis because what you're doing is, is a transformation of the data into uh, two dimensions 
Um, and this shows you uh, principal component analysis of all of those clusters. And I've uh, plotted the principal uh, components uh, one through nine uh, over the graphical representation of the data. And um, you can see that uh, for our clusters, um, principal component one um, explains about 30% of the variation and principal component two it explains another 30% of the variation. This is scaled up to three. Um, and uh, then you can break down what those components are made of, and uh, they break down relatively to uh, the elements that uh, we identified in the, uh, in the clustering routine that was used to sort those, uh, those centroids. Um, so dimensional reduction, what are the drawbacks? It is reduction, so you do lose information. The big assumption is that the distance measurement, and this is really a Euclidean distance measurement, although you can use a variety of different distance measurements, has some relationship to the biology. In other words, um, there is some uh, developmental or differentiational distance uh, between a naive B cell and an activated B cell. Um, now, without dimensional reduction, we're swimming in data, so it's a necessary evil. And again, all of these methods have some thresholding parameter. How many clusters, how many principal components, how much of a reduction are you going to use? And there's no rule to tell you which one to use. So let's move on to network representation, um, or hairballs. Uh, and uh, so... This is, a, uh, this is a gene regulatory network uh, from one of these subjects of the 720 genes uh, that were identified uh, after vaccination. And um, you can see that in order to fit this whole network in here, uh, we've got multiple connections. You can sort of barely read the labels. You can see pairs of, uh, of gene interactions where uh, elements only have one interaction. The ones that have zero are not on here. Um, but, and we use these network representations all the time, and we hate them um, because they're really hard to dissect things out of. So what's the problem with network diagrams? Um, so one of the problems is that the form of the diagram, the layout, is determined by a layout algorithm. And those layout algorithms are uh, designed to uh, distribute the nodes uh, within the uh, network um, so that uh, they have some separation uh, specifics and so that the length of the, uh, uh, of the edges um, is, uh, is proportional to importance or connectedness. Many of the layout algorithms are stochastic. So you can put the same uh, network into four different algorithms, um, and you can get uh, different networks if you run the same algorithm multiple times, or uh, you get different networks um, created by the different algorithms, and you can't easily compare them. So. Um, this, is a, this is a slide from the uh, website of uh, Martin uh, Mazinski, um, and uh, who's created a, a different type of, of plot. And I like this uh, little cartoon. Here's the hairball of a woolly mammoth. Um, this is a functional genomic inter uh, interaction network from yeast. Um, and uh, any of you who are uh, first-generation Star Trek fans will recognize these as the hairballs of Tribbles, which kept replicating uh, and uh, shutting down the starship. So this is a representation of an E. coli genomic network plotted using four different algorithms, and you wouldn't know it's the same thing. And your, your eye is drawn to a bunch of, uh, to several of these spots, and you ask, well, you know, why, why is this gene out here? What's the one in the middle um, that's regulating things? Um, so uh, Martin developed uh, an ingenious implementation of a network plot called a hive plot. So the hive plot still has all of these same connect, and this is a hive plot of the same uh, network. Um, you'll notice it's on three axes. 
Um, these, uh, these are uh, transcription factors. Um, these are uh, uh, housekeeping genes. Um, and uh, these are sort of intermediate controller genes. Uh, so you do have to have some prior knowledge uh, or uh, some way of classifying things on the different axes. But you can immediately see here that there is uh, one transcription factor um, that is connected to uh, many of the other genes. Um, and in fact, it's uh, connected to uh, one of the master regulators. This is uh, pseudo-colored. Um, you can actually, if you, uh, the software is interactive, so you can go down and identify which of these genes uh, you're looking at. You can actually color them uh, by the degree of interaction, activeness, or connectedness, or other, uh, uh, other criteria. Um, and uh, I'll give you the, the website. Um, I don't have Hive. I'm working on Hive plots of um, our data, uh, but it does require uh, a little more uh, data specification uh, than just for a, a general network plot. But what's the major issue with a network representation? Okay, we, we put together networks because we want to know how something works and what the outcome is and how it was created. Okay, this is a network, you'll, you'll recognize many of the players from uh, the uh, discovery of the sequence of DNA. This is a travel interaction network uh, from the double helix of um, every major laboratory and location and a few vacation spots in Europe that Jim Watson mentions. Uh, and uh, the major players, um, this shows you how they're connected. This shows you the travel uh, between the various laboratories. Uh, and uh, so Oxford is here and there's uh, Caltech and uh, there's uh, Chicago, uh, there's MIT, um, and uh, there's uh, uh, New York, Columbia. Um, but this network doesn't tell you anything. All it tells you about is the agents that interacted. It doesn't tell you anything about the context of the interaction or how it produced this model, uh, the model of the double helix. So um, even as we model networks and uh, causal networks, um, there's a lot more biology behind these. And our representations uh, have to convey that. And the state of the art of even looking at social networks um, don't do that. So what's the, what's the future of um, data representation? Well, um, unless you've got a, a large office with lots of blank walls um, or access to what's called a cave computer, uh, or cave visualization room, uh, where you can put um, all of your data up on walls, um, people are now exploring virtual worlds for data visualization. So uh, some of you may be familiar with Second Life, uh, which is a virtual world. Uh, it's a multiplayer, non-goal directed, uh, I guess you could call it a game. Um, where you can build things and you can build objects um, in three dimensions with lots of real estate and display data. Um, and there are a number of scientists that are uh, looking at uh, the ability to not only display but interact with uh, data represented as uh, virtual objects and virtual plots uh, in, these, uh, in these virtual worlds. Um, these are some plots from uh, a laboratory that is at the University of Michigan uh, that is actively involved in looking at data representation uh, in a virtual world. And uh, each of these represents a biplot. Uh, and uh, here you see this, this tiny little figure that looks like a cross is actually an avatar that can fly through the data you can uh, touch these uh, virtual plots, uh, and it will tell you something about the data there. You can, uh, it's not yet at the state where you can actually ask it to change the representations. These things are highly computationally intensive, um, but uh, I think um, really are the uh, one potential future way <coughs> of visual representation of data. Now, 
what's what's the key here? What I haven't shown you um, is um, I have gone in and actually shown you um, software in my presentation that I can manipulate the data, change model values, change the uh, projection, change the principal components, um, or have multiple paints. That software is beginning to exist. Um, and uh, so any of you um, who um, are interested, I would encourage you to look at Mathematica. They now have a, a document format called computational document format. You can actually plot your data and include, it's like PDF, it's called CDF. You can actually publish a manuscript now where you can allow people to manipulate your data, call up the data table, interact with your paper. It works great for models too. Um, you can have it uh, display your models and allow people to manipulate them. Um, I think that is probably the uh, future of data visualization. We need to think about the uh, how we're going to represent our data and what questions we're asking. The key elements missing from a flat two-dimensional paper are uh, it's not dynamic. Our data is time varying. Our papers are not. Our visualizations are generally um, low dimensional. Our data is high dimensional. Our ability to visualize high dimensional data in two or three dimensions is limited by color, real estate. Even if we show movies, our temporal memory is pretty short. And we're not really good at simultaneously tracking multiple items. We like to focus. And in fact, our science mimics that, right? We're looking for the two biomarkers. We're looking for the particular therapy that we can give, maybe at a particular point in time. Our optical judgment is also suspect for complex graphics. And so we need to get better at specifying the statistical uh, methods that we have used to create those graphics and organize our data. And I would say that we best remember and understand data that we interact with and manipulate. Not that we look at as a, as a static picture, which is the irony of this talk. I've shown you static pictures, and you're not able to interact with them. Um, and uh, all of us who are modelers uh, and deal with high dimensional data, um, I think we need to work with programmers to, uh, to get those tools. Some uh, resources in this uh, talk will be put up on our website, so anybody who uh, wants to uh, uh, take a look at some of the things that I've uh, talked about. Um, a lot of these graphics are informed by principles that I haven't spoken about. Um, Edward Tufta, for those of you uh, who uh, are not familiar with him, has a series of four incredible books, um, the first uh, talking about uh, uh, good visualization of uh, quantitative data. Um, they're, they're works of art. They're masterful on good data presentation in two dimensions. And the one piece of advice I would give is learn to use a command line computational graphics program. Uh, because the, uh, the programs that um, are canned at this point um, will not allow you to play with your data um, in the way that, uh, that you necessarily want to. Um, a lot of the data um, and uh, certainly many of the ideas um, that uh, form the basis of this talk uh, rest on an enormous team of people. Um, computational immunology is a team sport. Uh, the, uh, uh, many of the plots uh, in this talk, uh, the gene array plots were uh, produced by Alicia Hen, a postdoc, uh, now research associate in my laboratory. Melissa Ruda did uh, a large amount of the work on uh, the flow cytometry clustering. Um, and uh, I'm not going to read through this um, list, of course, but um, uh, the, uh, my colleagues in uh, biostatistics and other uh, collaborators throughout the university um, have been patient as I have inflicted my enthusiasm for this or that graphical uh, representation of data on them, and I'd like to thank them. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. <clears throat> so maybe I can ask something quickly uh, while I still remember it about your...
point that something moving is easier to notice and remember, and use the example of the gazelle and the next meal. And I think there's a much stronger example is when you're the next meal because <laughs> the slightest movement behind a bush means that the tiger's about to jump out on you. And I think that <clears throat> that is associated with recognition and also sort of instant stress. And I was wondering if anybody had looked at the people's ability to comprehend data and to remember it if they introduce some sort of threatening behavior into the data. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of us find the data threatening. I, I don't I, know I, about I, your I, laboratory, but sure. I don't know how, how happy my laboratory would be with threatening data. But, but actually, there, there is a good example, Tim. And, and the data is the most threatening when you have to present it in a few hours and you haven't analyzed it yet. And it's amazing what you can see. <laughs> Tom? Uh, when, in the early days of data representation, we had uh, criteria that we could use to determine uh, how well it was represented. And, and this was sort of primitive stuff, but I mean, when you're talking about uh, uh, compression, for example, you can, you can use compression ratios. And it turns out that, that that is closely related to some very important ideas in statistics. And so they managed to. Uh, enrich each other. What are people thinking about now in terms of criteria for, for data representation? It's no longer sufficient just to compress it as much as possible, but I'm not, it's not clear to me what kind of criteria might be used. Are people thinking about these things quantitatively? So, so the answer to that is yes. I am by no means an uh, uh, expert in this area, more like a highly in, interested um, uh, observer, uh, some of the um, the best uh, or most advanced quantitative uh, measures of representation have to do with network models, um, and uh, there are um, specific uh, criteria of representation of interactions um, that are quantitative and statistical. Um, there, I, there are a number of other um, criteria in terms of um, data representation and dimensional reduction about how much information um, you're losing. Much of that has to, it comes from, um, again, people who have studied um, very large data sets and network interactions uh, and uh, information uh, theory. Um, with respect to how much information you lose about a particular outcome. But I think you make a very good point, and that is, you know, we, we often, certainly on the immunology side, um, tend to put up uh, representations of our data as um, graphics uh, and not a lot of description about how we have distilled things down and what we have lost. So one of the reasons for my showing you that figure about how we arrived at 700 uh, different uh, uh, significant genes in that data set, as well as how we selected uh, at what trade-offs we made in getting to that data, um, was in partly, you know, not to say that this representation is better than another, because we don't necessarily have criteria for that, um, but to say, um, up front, here are the trade-offs we made. Jim?
No, I, I think you make a, an excellent point, and that is, um, you know, when we get immersed in the data, we often confuse our representations of the of the data with um, reality. And we've all been in seminars where um, numerous partisan arguments have occurred, um, which are basically uh, about representation. Um, our data, just like uh, what we see or what we read, is highly processed um, by the time it gets down uh, to a, a flow cytometry diagram. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. We need to work on methods of, of uh, trying to uh, break through a, that and constantly remind ourselves in some fashion um, that uh, it's, of course, much more complex than our methods of distilling things. I think your last point, are there ways of developing that intuition? I think that's the key. Um, the, the heat maps are great because they're, they're very intuitive. You can tell a com you can communicate some complex ideas with an image where you don't have to talk about them. Um, and it is one of their large attractions, although they're also um, greatly um, abused. Um, but in some sense, I think your question is like asking, well, isn't there a way that you can teach me something about quantum mechanics without mathematics? <laughs> and I think that's... It is a legitimate question. Right? question. Yeah, you know, and, and, you know, certainly um, somebody like Feynman did, a, did an incredible job of that. Um, but I think that if you're an in-the-trenches um, scientist, and part of the reason that everybody was at this course um, is... Uh, that you are going to need to learn a technical abstract language. And for a lot of those representations, um, it's going to have to be mathematical and statistics. Um, it depends. It depends the level you're communicating on. So, you know, if the level you're communicating on is, uh, if that other person speaks the same language as you do, the, the, the challenge is communicating to somebody who does not necessarily speak that same language or have quite that level of skill. And, and I would say that, uh, you know, my feeling about that is um, you need to let them play with those representations, even though they might not understand them because you know, un understanding how something works actually comes from being able to manipulate it and break it. Um, you know, your level of understanding uh, of a motorcycle is much greater if you've ever tried to disassemble one and then reassemble it and had six parts that you have no idea where they, the hell they came from is. Um, and uh, that, that is enhanced by an understanding of mechanics and combustion engines and things like that. Um, but, uh, but you do gain a level of understanding from manipulation. I think one more question and then we, for some alcohol. <laughs> Steve? So if what you mean by communicate is what are the most sensitive parameters, what happens to the, the outcome of your model when things blow up, uh, 
when you uh, when you go uh, to the limits of some of the parameters, how do they interact? Um, I think the answer to that is um, yes, and I alluded to the computational document format in Mathematica. Um, so, for example, you can write a paper and embed your model in that paper with uh, not only a, a parameter table in, in a way that that like driving an automobile. You don't have to know anything about what's underneath the hood. All you got to be able to do is turn the steering wheel and other things, um, and uh, then you can communicate by uh, your graphical representations of outputs, which change as the reader interacts with the paper and, and changes things. You can put your sensitivity analysis right there and allow somebody to manipulate the model. Um, so I, I think those kinds of, of um, in some sense, science fiction interactive books um, are, are going to become a reality for scientific papers and for modeling. Um, and I think that um, that will raise the level of discourse so that uh, you know, if I have a paper that um, Rob has published uh, on migration of, uh, of T cells and various modeling parameters, um, and I want to ask, well, you know, I, I think your assumption about the cytokine gradient was wrong and your random walk formula uh, should be something different. I don't have to recreate his entire work. I can go into that paper and uh, change the uh, formula um, and look at using the same data set and uh, the rest of the model being the same as to what happens. And and I think that level of discourse is, in some sense, what we're all striving for. We just need the tools to do it. Thank you. <laughs>